Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, this guy, when he was a kid, he thought Dick Clark's rockin' New Year's Eve party was hosted by Dick Fart. He is the captain. You can call me Richard. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Happy New Year, you filthy animals. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Zookeeper IPA by Empyrean, garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. This IPA is untamed with tart citrus and tropical rainforest aroma. Zookeeper is sweet natured with an animalistic soul. Inside all of us, there is a wild thing and this sessionable IPA was brought to us by these wild things right here. First up, we have OG Neil Berry's who says, love this podcast. And a big cheers, mates, to Elizabeth and Reno, Nevada. Oh, and here we have several citizens in beautiful, snowy parts unknown helping out the show. First up, we have Rebecca, and we have Nancy, and we have Samantha. And a big we like your jib to Jane in L.A. Next, we have Katie in Duluth, Minnesota, and her friend and co-worker Sandy. And last but not least, we have David and Jacques in Highland Village, Texas. Thanks, everybody, for going to TrueCrimeGarage.com and clicking on that donate button and helping out with today's show. And make sure you follow us on social media, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff, at True Crime Garage. And thank you so much for making 2018 a great year for us, and we look forward to 2019. All right, Captain, that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Zanesville, Ohio, a little before 5 p.m. on October 18, 2011. Sam Kopchak walked to the paddock behind his home to attend to the horse he bought nine days earlier. The horse was acting skittish and moved toward the far corner of the field. On the other side of the fence separating them from his neighbor, Terry Thompson's property, Kopchak noticed Thompson's horses seemed very agitated. They were running in a circle, and in the center, there was some kind of dark shape. Only when the shape broke out of the circle could Kopchak see it was a black bear. The bear was small and ran away from Kopchak. Kopchak planned to put his horse in the barn and go back inside his home. He walked over to his horse and started guiding the animal to the barn when something caught his eye. Just on the other side of the fence and staring right at them, was a fully grown African lion. Kopchak continued with his horse to the barn. Even though the lion could easily clear the fence separating them, it just sat there watching him and the horse as they hurriedly walked toward the barn. Sam Kopchak and the horse made their way inside, and Sam locked the doors behind them. Once there, Sam grabbed the phone and called his home, where he knew his 84-year-old mother was sitting watching TV. She picked up the phone, and Sam explained what he saw. Mrs. Kopchak telephoned the home of Terry Thompson, her neighbor, but no one answered. Inside the barn, Sam Kopchak kept a watchful eye on the events just outside. To his astonishment, he spotted a tiger. The tiger spotted the horses and quickly went after them. With no one answering the phone at the Thompson's house, Mrs. Kopchak called 911. The emergency dispatcher picked up. Mrs. Kopchak said, Yes, this is Dolores Kopchak on Kopchak Road. We live next to Terry Thompson, and there's a bear and a lion out. The dispatcher questioned further. There's a bear and a lion out? Mrs. Kopchak replied, Yeah, right up behind us. That would be the call that set the whole town on edge. For with that 911 call, Postal delivery was suspended, and the Zanesville City Schools were closed, and thus began 
the search for lions, tigers, and bears. Deputy John Mary was serving a court summons a couple of miles away when the call came through about large and dangerous animals in the area of the Thompson and Kopchak properties. He responded immediately, arriving a short time later. There he could see, just inside Thompson's fence, a tiger, a black bear, and two lions. While he was waiting for Mrs. Kopchak to answer the door, he saw a large gray wolf running southward along the road. He ran to his patrol car and followed the wolf. After following the animal for a while, the wolf veered from the road and started running toward a house. The officer pulled over abruptly, parked the cruiser, and popped the trunk. Keeping his eyes on the wolf, Officer Mary retrieved a rifle from the trunk and set out on foot following the animal. Along the way, he called in each observation and action to police dispatch. Do you understand how big a wolf is, right? Well, yeah. I mean, they're... It's not like... He's tracking a big dog. This is like a dog times 100. Yeah, it's not not like a coyote, like right. you're picturing in your mind right now. Picture that, but times it by about three because mm-hmm. they're giant. So he's keeping his eye on this animal. He's got the rifle now that he got from the trunk of his car. And he's following this wolf on foot. And he said he was about 80 yards away when an order came over the radio to put the animal down. Officer Mary fired a single shot and dropped his target. After the wolf went down, Mary fired a few more times to make sure the animal was dead. He was inspecting the body when a call came over the radio. Some officers cornered a lion near Thompson's residence, so he hurried back. Mary drove up the hill and stopped near the Thompson's driveway. There he saw a black bear. Officer Mary got out of his cruiser, and facing him and running straight toward him was the bear. Armed with only his standard issue weapon, the officer fired a single shot before the charging bear could reach him. Just in a short time, officers saw several lions, at least one tiger, a cougar, a black bear, and a grizzly. The officers were ordered to patrol the borders of the Thompson's property. So he's ordered to take down the wolf, but as far as patrolling the property, were they told to also take down anything that they saw at the time? Yeah, I believe that Anything that they spotted, you know, they wanted to basically form a perimeter Mm -hmm. around this property. And if any of these animals are trying to leave the property, their orders were to shoot to kill. Mm -hmm. Um, So here's the situation, Captain. We have the Thompson's property. He was known, Terry Thompson was known to have exotic animals. And so this wasn't like something that was unknown to the sheriff's department or to the local police. Mm -hmm. They knew about this. The problem here is these animals are loose. They believe they're coming from Thompson's property. And when they get to the property, they can see lions, cougars, you know, multiple bears. Oh my. And the question here is how many of these animals does he have? And how many of them are loose, and why are they loose? Right, because this is this is a private property. This isn't like a zoo, right? Where a bunch of locals have gone through and said, "Hey, I've been there before. We know that there's forty animals or a hundred animals. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows how many animals there are." At five thirty-five p.m., the man in charge, Sheriff Matt Lutz, arrived on the scene. In the fifteen minutes that it took him to get there, the reports over the radio escalated. The seriousness became very clear. There were several large and dangerous animals on the loose. Now, in the immediate area surrounding the Thompson property, there's an apartment building, soccer fields, and Interstate 70. No one seemed to know where property owner Terry Thompson was or what was really going on. Sergeant Steve Blake decided he should drive up to Thompson's house. So we know that there's animals all over this property, and this guy decides, hey, I'm going to drive up to the house. Mm Mm-hmm. And who cares if there's lions there or tigers there? Yeah, they need to locate Terry Thompson, and they need to speak with him to figure out what's going on. I mean, it takes somebody with some big cojones yeah. to do that. Or or a lot of, uh, he trusts his vehicle. You know what I mean? <laughs> like he's like, yeah, Who cares about the vehicle? <laughs> right. You have to still get out of the car and go to the door. 
Well, as he neared the farm buildings, he saw more animals. Uh, their cages had either been cut through or left open. Mm-hmm. The officer honked the horn several times, but no one came out of Thompson's house. Back near the road, John Moore arrived. Moore worked on the Thompson property for Terry and took care of the land and fed Thompson's exotic animals. John Moore went with Officer Blake back up to the Thompson house. Along the way, they saw nothing. When they arrived near the home, Moore pointed out some cages. The cages contained two monkeys and a dog. Still no sign of Terry Thompson. They turned around, but before they could reach the road, they spotted a large white tiger near the barn. Mm -hmm. At the tiger's paws, there was a lifeless human body, and the tiger appeared to be eating it. Okay, so... Eating the body. Eating the body. The human body. mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is a crazy scene, right? I mean, we've talked about a lot of strange scenes uh, throughout the years on this show. Some would say it's a typical Thursday. This has got to be one of the craziest scenes that we've ever discussed. And, mm-hmm. and we've, we've often spoke about how easy it is for armchair detectives or people watching TV at home to go, well, why did the police do this? Or why didn't they do that? And we've always tried to remind everyone that often they don't know what they're walking into when they arrive on a scene, sometimes they get a domestic call or sometimes they get a call about, you know, a a strange vehicle somewhere Mm -hmm. and they arrive and they don't know what's going on or two drunk guys in a garage doing a podcast. The thing here is they at least get the call that there's a, a lion and a bear out wandering around. But when they get to the scene, they're spotting all kinds of animals. Now, Mm -hmm. since law enforcement could not get in touch with Terry Thompson, and it was likely his body they spotted near the barn. They needed to get some intel from Mr. John Moore. So they did an impromptu interview with Moore and Moore's fiance at the foot of Thompson's driveway. After some back and forth, they determined that there were 56 animals on the property. I'm unclear, Captain, if this includes the two monkeys and the dog found in the cages near the home, or if this is from another portion of this very large property. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the authorities phoned the Columbus Zoo. The Columbus Zoo is is pretty well known. I mean, it's nationally known. Opened up in 1927, the Columbus Zoo is considered to be one of maybe even the number one zoo in the United States. It is. I mean, sometimes it goes falls to number two, but when I rank all the zoos, it's the best. The there world. you go. The, the nonprofit Columbus Zoo houses thousands of animals and hundreds of different species from all over the world. The zoo is about 40 miles away from the Thompson property. The zoo's chief operating officer was alerted by a staff member who told him, we have to go to Terry Thompson's. The animals are out. Now, the COO didn't know who Thompson was, but others at the zoo did. Mm -hmm. Dr. Michael Berry, the zoo's director of animal health, was up at Thompson's property to inspect his large private collection of animals in 2008. Barry said he was horrified at what he saw there in terms of security, cleanliness, and animal cruelty. It wasn't like this guy had this facility that was nice for the animals. These were small cages for big animals. There was, I mean, it was dirty. Mm-hmm. It looked like they weren't fed properly. But the laws being so, I guess you'd say loose in Ohio, mm-hmm. that all they could really do is do these checks on these individuals and then maybe find them or have a a permit violation. But even that wasn't even a big fine. The Columbus zoo assembled its capture and recovery team armed with both tranquilizer, dark guns and regular weapons. And they set out for Zanesville continuing the interview with Moore. He told police he last spoke with Terry Thompson the night before at 9 PM. The officers needed to get back on Thompson's property and move to see what was really going on. The plan, one officer would drive a pickup truck while four armed officers would sit together in the bed of the truck. Mm -hmm. And they were told to neutralize the animals on the loose if they saw any. They drove back to where the lifeless body was spotted. Two tigers surprised the crew charging the bed of the truck. The officers were forced to shoot them. The tigers were put down. From where the truck was, the men could see a man's body flat on his back. A white tiger was on top of him. The tiger stood up and was staring at the truck. They believed the body was that of a deceased Terry Thompson. Mm -hmm. The unit received a call to respond to another portion of the property. When they returned, the white tiger was gone. 
At the spot of the body, they found bolt cutters and stainless steel Ruger 357 Magnum revolver. The cause of death seemed to be a gunshot to the head. The gunshot wound suggested a barrel placed in the mouth. There was a sizable laceration on Thompson's head that was consistent with a big cat's bite. The body had laid in one spot for some time, and then it was dragged some distance away by his arm. The body had been chewed on. There were also pieces of raw chicken scattered around the body. Well, that's interesting because you wonder where this raw chicken is coming from. Was Thompson carrying it? Well, here's the thing. One of the experts from the zoo theorized that Thompson probably used the raw chicken to entice the animals to eat the chicken, but also eat his body. Mm. So let's talk more about the zoo's involvement, right? Because I remember hearing this on the radio and thinking, cool, they're bringing in the experts from the zoo. They're, they're doing the right thing. Right. But by the time the Columbus Zoo team arrived, it was dark out. Well, and we already have a bunch of dead animals. Well, they were told that it wasn't safe for them to try to tranquilize anything because so many animals were circulating and others were scattering outward. Well, and, and let's break this down because what I heard was, first of all, when you hit the animal with a tranquilizer, it works best if you hit it in not a fatty area, but a, a muscle area. Mm -hmm. So in the dark, you want to know, did you get a good shot or a bad shot? Yeah. And if it hits a muscle, it's going to take five to 10 minutes. But now that animal is going to be irritated and those animals are around other animals. So do you irritate that animal and have it attack another animal? Mm. Or again, if you have a bad shot, it could take 10 minutes, 15 minutes or not completely work. So then you have the fear of you have four tranquilizer guns. You start shooting these animals and they start after five, 10 minutes, they start dropping and, and going to sleep, I guess. Right. But then you could approach them and all of a sudden, boom, they're back up. Mm -hmm. So this, this becomes uh, a hazard more so because of, the, because of the time of day and not being able to see where you're shooting the animal at. Yeah. And this was covered. This story was covered really well by a lot of our local media coming from Columbus, but one of the best uh, sources for information on this case comes from GQ magazine. They did a, a, a big story on this about a year after it took place around the one year anniversary. Mm -hmm. And according to that article, even when a tranquilizer dose is successfully administered, it needs about 10 minutes to take effect. And there is great care that is required to establish that it was done correctly. Right. So as you were pointing out, and as this article points out, it is impossible with so many animals running around to, to do it this way, to, mm -hmm. to correctly administer a tranquilizer. When the zoo people returned to the site the next day, this was 5.30 a.m., and they were joined by Jack Hanna. Now, Hanna is, is famous. He is famous for his appearances on shows like The David Letterman Show, mm -hmm. and he established his career at the Columbus Zoo. The previous day, he was doing an event at Penn State, and although he had just had knee surgery, he drove straight there. He says 100 miles an hour. Zanesville is right between the wilds and the Columbus Zoo. Mm -hmm. So I think that become, it makes it more his problem, even though it's not his problem, if that makes any sense. And Zanesville it, it holds a, a special significance for Jack Hanna. He went to school around there. He enlisted in the Army there. Mm -hmm. I guess he spent his honeymoon night there as well. And mm. Hannah was a trusted and still is a trusted animal advocate. And Zanesville only being an hour from us. I mean, it was a place that my cover band played all the time. I mean, those people there, they love Garth Brooks and they love NSYNC. Mm -hmm. I played there so often, probably every six weeks or so. And so when this hit the news, it was like, it could have been the weekend I was there. Yeah. And let me just say, if I saw a lion, I'd straight shit my pants. And the really sad thing here is by the time that the zoo was on the scene the following day at 5.30 a.m., when, you know, when they had sunlight to work, by this point, 49 animals were confirmed dead. There was only one unaccounted for animal. This was a monkey, though no trace would ever be found of it dead or alive. It was eventually decided that it most likely was eaten by one of the cats. Right, like once um, he was letting all the animals out, that during that time it was attacked by one of the cats. So 
six of Terry Thompson's animals survived. Three were leopards. They were still in their cages. Two more were monkeys kept in the living room of the house and two small bird cages. And finally, out back near the empty swimming pool was a small grizzly bear, also in a bird cage. The house itself was disgusting. One person on scene said it was the most horrific smelling house they'd ever been in. There was garbage and feces all over the place. Garbage bags filled with garbage that was knocked over. And I mean, the place was just filthy. Yeah, his wife is going to arrive at the scene around lunchtime. Yeah, Thompson's wife, Marion, uh, she gets to the home. Now, she had to be convinced that the survivors, these animals that survived this whole nightmare situation, they had to convince her that they needed to take them to the zoo for safekeeping. Right. She was saying, please, Mr. Hannah, don't take my children. Mm -hmm. Marion insisted on removing the monkeys from their cages herself uh, she was waving off the zoo's personnel and getting these monkeys out of the cages. She explained that she spent $30,000 buying them. And it seemed that she did have a real bond with the animals before she opened the cages. She sang to them like a sing a lullaby or something. Right. So she, before she opened up the cages that weren't the right sizes for those animals and the filth that was on her property before all that stuff, she had a real bond with them. Th that's what people reported at the scene. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they said that the, the filthiest house they ever seen seen the monkeys clang to her. Um, and she took them one by one out of the cages. It was decided that the dead animals were to be buried, uh, there and then on this property. And Mrs. Thompson chose the spot where they buried the animals. So the simplest and shortest version of this story is we have a man, Terry Thompson, who on this second day of these events, they firmly believe, law enforcement firmly believes, this man took his own life, but before doing so, he opened or cut open several of these cages, letting out 49 animals. Mm -hmm. And these exotic animals, as we said, lions, tigers, bears, cougars, were roaming this property. Yeah, a lot of people think there was two agendas here. One for him to set him free, but then, like you said before, after he committed suicide, that they would eat his body. But that also, maybe that the second reason for this was that he wanted the animals to wreak havoc onto Zanesville. Yeah, and the thing here is, regarding the cages, some of them being open, some of them being cut, mm -hmm. I don't know enough about it to speculate what was going on there. You would think he would just open the cages, but one person on the scene said that they believed the cages were cut so that he couldn't reverse what he was doing. Right. Like the, the, you know, he's, he's setting this action forward and it's going to go down no matter what, once he cuts that first cage. Well, and a lot of people speculate too, that he didn't release the leopards because they would have killed him before he would have been able to kill himself. True Crime Garage is brought to you by Simply Safe. We all put off doing things we know we need to do. Security can be like that too. You know it's a good idea, but it always slips down the list of priorities. Maybe it's the idea of paying a middleman or scheduling a six hour installation window, like you have the time for that. Well, fellow procrastinators, now is the time to act because Simply Safe's extended holiday sale ends soon. Simply Safe got rid of all the reasons not to get home security. Because they believe nothing should come between you and protecting your home. We're talking no contracts, no markups, no complicated installation. It's professional quality home security that's so easy you'll have it up and running in minutes. So yes, you could add this to your epic to-do list. Or hey, you could do it right now. Just go to simplysafe.com slash garage and order before January 8th to save with their extended holiday sale. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. What if your worst nightmare was real? In Mind's Eye, the first fiction podcast from the Parcast Network, homicide detective Kate McClay is plagued by nightmares. So she enlists her radio journalist husband to help get to the bottom of her horrifying dreams. And in search for the end of her nightmares, Kate fights against psychology, science, her own family, and even a serial killer. The scariest monsters 
are those hiding in our own minds. Mind's Eye is perfect for listeners of True Crime Garage, true crime podcasts, mystery novels, and audio dramas like Limetown and Homecoming. Brought to you by Parcast, the storytelling team behind hit shows like Serial Killers, Cults, and Unsolved Murders, True Crime Stories. This six-episode psychological thriller premieres December 24th with new episodes on Mondays. Listen today by searching and subscribing to Mind's Eye wherever you listen to podcasts. That's Mind's Eye, M-I-N-D apostrophe S-E-Y-E. Or visit parcast.com slash Mind's Eye to start listening now. That's parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash Mind's Eye to listen now. Support for today's show comes from Third Love. Using millions of real women's measurements, Third Love designed its bras with breast size and shape in mind for impeccable fit and an incredible feel. Just answer a few simple questions from Third Love's Fit Finder quiz to find your perfect fit. Third Love offers double the number of sizes that most brands offer. Cups A through H, bands up to 48. And with lightweight memory foam cups, straps that won't slip, and tagless labels, you'll want to wear these soft and breathable bras and underwear every day, especially the new cotton t-shirt bras and underwear. And thanks to their 100% fit guarantee, returns and exchanges are free and easy. Our show has been supported by Third Love for a while now, and we hear nothing but great positive feedback from our listeners. If you haven't checked out Third Love, you need to check them out today. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash garage now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash garage for 15% off today. That's thirdlove.com slash garage to get 15% off today. Get to the very latest now in a story that has captured the attention of the nation coming out of Zanesville, Ohio. That's where a man who had a menagerie of wild, exotic animals on his property, more than 50 of them apparently, opened their cages to set them free before taking his own life on Tuesday. A number of those animals, 48 of them, were killed. Uh, and there is a lot of question this morning as to why they were killed, why they could not have been tranquilized, perhaps moved to a zoo. Joining us to help answer some of those questions this morning is Jack Hanna, Director Emeritus of the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. He worked tirelessly with police as they tracked down those animals. Jack, good to have you with us this morning. And it is obvious to so many just in watching you over these last couple of days how hard all of this has been on you as an animal lover. It's been the worst thing that's ever happened to me in 40 years of this career, 40 years. But, you know, I sat there yesterday when I got there and at daylight and saw the carnage of the animals. And I go, why couldn't we have tranquilized them? But then when I was with the veterinarians and the sheriff, you only, only had four, we had four tranquilizer guns that got there. Now, once they got there, we're 50 miles away on each side. The darkness was about 45 minutes. Picture, I don't know if you see these bears behind me. Those are grizzlies. We had a couple of those loose, along with 18 tigers, 17 lions and lionesses. So picture about 30, 40 of them coming out of this whole compound with, with, with four tranquilizer guns. Now, if we even shot one of these animals, like a tiger or a bear, this thing has to hit a certain muscle. They're, they're real good shots, these folks are. But we have 30-something animals coming at, coming at the sheriff, right, with our, with our people. So what can be done? with four guns. What you have happen here, once you hit the animal, the animal goes and for three to 10 minutes, he's not down. He's just running everywhere because he's nervous. The drug is taking effect. No telling what would have happened if four tranquilizer guns were all we had there and that started with 34 animals. They're huge carnivores. We would have had, there's no doubt in my mind after 30 something years of 40 something years of doing this, we'd have had some deaths on our hand. Therefore, he had to make the critical decision. Every time I look at it, I know why people around the world are contacting me around England, Australia, all over, are very upset with over this whole thing, the sheriff doing this. He had no choice. Or we would have had major loss of human life in Zanesville, Ohio, yesterday, during the nighttime, especially yesterday morning when the sun came up. So it's all over with now. Uh, I sit here, I sat here last night and cried several times. I'll look at this, these pictures. I don't believe it's happened, but what had to happen, or we would have, mm -hmm. had a mess on our hands beyond comprehension. Jack, six of the animals were able to be saved. They were transferred to the zoo. How are they doing this morning? 
They're doing very well. We have footage, I think, here uh, right now of the animals footage that was taken early. It's about 4 a.m. this morning. They're eating well. They're doing well. And by the way, the governor, we met all day uh, last night. The governor now is passing laws immediately. There'll be no more animal auctions in the state of Ohio with exotic animals. Within six months of that, we're going to go out here, the people like we saw last night, and those folks better expect a knock on their door. And if they're not up to standards, which are going to be great standards, because I'm going to have something to do with setting those standards, those animals will be taken immediately and taken to the wilds where we're going to spend several hundreds of thousands of dollars building a repository there mm -hmm. for these animals to have a home in a decent way. Hey, you bring up such an interesting point here. Uh, Terry Thompson, who had these animals, had a record of animal yep. abuse. Uh, authorities were called out a number of times. He even had convictions on related charges, and yet he kept these animals. The conditions had been described as deplorable in some cases. If we knew of the situation there, if it was seen firsthand, how was it allowed to continue? That's just what we've been sitting over here for the last three hours since 5.30 this morning. My wife asked me the same exact question. The sheriff had been up there 30, 40 times. He went to prison. My own people, I, I didn't know about, I knew they were out there somewhere. There's people in Ohio that have these animals. I didn't know it was him. My own people went there and they weren't allowed. They went to the tobacco and firearms people went there and they went to arrest him for all the weapons. They went there, but they weren't allowed to do anything because the law states he's not open to the public. So the United States government cannot inspect his property to, to write him any kind of citations. So what do we have here? We have a situation that was unbelievable. There wasn't any law that we could do anything to him. So all they, could do, all they could do, Jack, was basically check and make sure he had the permits that he needed to have in the state of Ohio, and that was it. Is it? Can you imagine that? Well, that, that whole thing is changing in the next 60 to 90 days, and we're, this will be one of the toughest states in the country when this gets done to pull anything like this off ever again. As long as I'm here, I know the governor. Governor Strickland started this whole thing. Governor Kasich now is going to carry it through in the next few uh, months, and we'll be out there, and this will not happen again here under my watch in the state of Ohio unless somebody is sneaking this without any of us knowing inside of a cave or something. So many questions about why this happened and how it happened, what his thinking was before he took his own life. You actually met it, with his wife Yep. yesterday, who's dealing with a number of things at this point. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit, if you can, Jack, about this conversation and any insight she may have been able to offer you. Well, what happened was I understood she was very upset with me for taking her children. Remember, these, these were her children, for me, for someone killing her children. And why would I be up there trying to take the remaining three leopards, the certain uh, little small primates, I say small apes this big, as well as one grizzly? Why was I taking, please don't care, take, she was crying. She was actually uncontrollable. And you know what I did? When you see somebody that's just beaten to death, that's just done, she's lost her husband, you know, I can't help that, but her husband committed suicide. But you see someone that's lost everything. I hugged her and I tried to hold her. She was shaking and she, I've lost everything. You're taking my, I said, I'm not taking your children. I'm taking them to the Columbus Zoo right now to take care of them. They're still your children, they're your animals. We cannot bring them back in these conditions. I'm trying to help you right now. And you know something, tears started coming out of my eyes. I'm not just telling that for you. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for Jack Hanna. I'm saying that the emotions that have been with me and our staff, the, the sheriff's deputies, when you saw those deputies sitting in there, had to shoot those animals. I wish you could have seen their faces. I wish you could have seen them when they said they had to go and talk to their children. That's not something that they wanted. Half of them looked like they had tears in their eyes, what they'd done. They, they were afraid that somebody would look at me because here they are shooting animals that Jack Hanna's trying to save. You know, this is something that, that if you try to write a script for this, I couldn't even imagine even Hollywood coming up with something like this. This thing is like a, 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 such a bad dream for all of us that uh, it's over now. The animals lost their lives. The only good out of this came that in 90 to 100 days from now, this state... We'll, we'll hopefully never have to face this again. But the woman is, you, is, was, was beaten. She's done. And what was I to do but hold her and tell her that, you know, this will hopefully never happen again. That's all I could do. Jack, can't tell you how much we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. All right. The first beer break of 2019. Yeah, and we heard Jack Hanna talking there during that clip. The strange thing, though, here, Captain, is while that was Terry Thompson's body that they found on his property, mm -hmm. you know, you and I know there has been some question. And the question here is, did Terry Thompson take his own life or was he murdered? Yeah, well, because somebody's sitting there and they're thinking, hey, I'm listening to the True Crime Garage. And what are these wackadoos talking about? Where's the crime? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all. It's a crime to release these animals into the public. Mm -hmm. And if they would have got a hold of somebody, this, you know, somebody would have been facing murder charges. But now you have where the individual that let these go, did he commit suicide or was it foul play? And you know what, though? As sad as it is that all these animals, these magnificent animals, were killed yeah. that night, it's almost a miracle that no one was hurt. Yes. In this whole thing. And look, we're we're animal lovers here. 
and so is obviously Jack Hanna. Mm-hmm. But he said it best: the fact that there was zero human casualties. This is almost a miracle. Mm-hmm. Well, let's take a look at Terry Thompson. Terry Thompson was 62 years of age at the time of his death. Yeah. Thompson's body was taken from the scene for an autopsy at the Licking County Coroner's Office. Terry William Thompson was 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighed 174 pounds. He was wearing a black t-shirt, blue jeans, and white briefs. He had a cardiovascular disease. The only notable substance in his blood was Benadryl. There was gray powder residue on his left hand that appeared to be from a gun being fired. Aside from the gunshot wound, they found a two and quarter inch vertical laceration on the right lower forehead and along the spine of his nose. There were 21 other injuries or clusters of injuries that they detailed these simply as on his head and neck area. Right. Others were noted on his torso and legs. And then there was a five and three quarter inch by four inch gaping laceration involving the pubic region with the absence of genitalia with exposure of the pubic bones and adjacent soft tissue. Right. But to be clear, we have one gunshot wound. Correct. So we believe that is from himself. He's or or we think because we have the gun residue on the hand. Now, people argued that. Uh, Thompson was a guitar player and that he played right-handed guitar. And so the fact that he would have been shooting with his left hand would be odd. Mm -hmm. I I also make the argument that I know a lot of people that are left-handed that play guitar in the traditional right-handed way Mm -hmm. because your dominant hand on a, on a right-handed guitar is your left hand. So that to me is no sign of what hand he is. Right. But I think, you know, his wife probably could tell us what hand he was. Well, remember John Moore and remember Moore said that he last spoke with Terry Thompson at nine o'clock the previous evening. Thompson told Moore about a letter he received from an unnamed author saying Terry Thompson's wife, Marion, had been unfaithful. Now, I don't know if she actually cheated on Terry, but if she did, this is how this went down. Remember we said Dr. Michael Berry, the director of animal health at the Columbus Zoo, was up at Thompson's property for an inspection back in 2008. Right. This, I believe, was at the request of law enforcement. Dr. Berry was accompanying a, an ATF raid that eventually led to Terry Thompson going to prison. Thompson was in prison for a year on gun charges. Even though Dr. Berry did not approve of the animal situation as far as the law is concerned, there was no action that they could take concerning these animals. You know, this is for a multitude of reasons. One, the animal laws in Ohio, as you pointed out, and actually many states at the time were pretty relaxed, right? Well, very relaxed animal laws. The other reason Thompson didn't receive any punishment for the animal situation was because under the old setup, you were allowed a certain amount of time to improve the animal situation and environment before action would be taken against you. So basically they saw a problem. They told him, Hey, you can't be treating these animals or taking care of them in this way. Right. And instead of there being an immediate punishment, like there would be for other laws being broken, he had time to correct the situation. So he made changes or upgrades or whatever to improve these facilities. But regardless, he went to prison for one year for the gun charges According to this letter, Thompson's wife cheated on him while he was in prison. Thompson was only out of prison for three weeks before he opened these cages, cut some of them open, and killed himself. Yeah. When Terry Thompson spoke with John Moore at 9 p.m. the night before, Terry was asking John Moore about Marion having cheated on him while he was in prison. Moore told Thompson he didn't know whether she did or didn't. And then Terry makes this statement back to him. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I have a plan to find out and you'll know it when it happens. Okay. So his plan was to release these animals and then maybe you should tell him. No, I don't think Mm. that I don't think he thought he would figure it out. I think he had this plan to do something very crazy, Right. right? I mean, letting these animals out and then taking his own life. And I think it was just that it's kind of a, a very, ominous statement, right? Hey, I I've got a plan. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but when it happens, you'll know. 
because it, it's going to make the news. You're going to hear about this. Yeah, when you see the lions running down, you know, seventy <laughs> right. on the freeway, you, you're going to know what it happened. Well, but this is this is a tricky situation, anyways, because one, it's like I don't like to take anybody's rights away. So should somebody have the right to have a tiger? I, to me, it's like, well, if you can afford to house one and you can uh, and you can care for it properly, if you have enough land. You know, what's the difference between somebody owning one privately and, and somebody having one at the zoo? Mm-hmm. But now the zoo has funding. Do you have the funding? In this case, Thompson just doesn't have the funding. Right. And maybe he had the funding at one time. Mm-hmm. And then maybe this is part of everything slipping away from him. He has this house with some land. He has all these animals he can't take care of. He has people coming after him saying, because one, the more and more animals you, you have, the more and more inspections they're going to do, the more and more they're going to be nitpicky. You need to fix this. You need to fix that. I don't think he had enough money to take care of these animals. And instead of being the bigger man and saying, hey, how about I, I sell these to somebody that can or, mm-hmm. or donate these to some zoos, give these animals proper homes. It was almost like he was stuck, like he was going to try to figure out this problem. I got, I got to make this right. And then he, he had these illegal guns, right? Mm-hmm. That's what he was arrested on. Correct. So you have, so just an odd situation where you have these tigers and these lions living on your property. Now you have these illegal guns. And look, there's probably a lot of people in rural areas that have illegal guns. But maybe because they couldn't get him on charges for the animals, they went after the gun route. Well, the ATF was there for the raid. And I think what they did was they knew animals were on the property. So they decided to bring someone in from the zoo with them to accompany them. Right. But what I'm saying is if they have charged him, if they have given him him fails and, and charged him to fix things and they can't get it where they can stop him on that level. Well, we also heard a rumor that he has these guns. And that'd be another way to get him in trouble. And just basically, I mean, we see this happen with a lot of people. Like, oh, we know this guy's a drug runner. We can't get him on drug charges, but we can get him on taxes. Mm-hmm. I just wonder if it's the similar thing. If he was becoming such a, such a nuisance, if they knew that these living conditions were not fit for the animals, but we can't do anything but charge him some fees that he's going to pay that maybe this is an, an, another na- avenue to get him to get him to wake up and fix his situation. Well, let's unpack some things before we move on. So first, it was determined that Terry Thompson took his own life after opening the cages on his property that day. Now, second, you got to wonder, how could a private citizen amass a collection of so many unusual and potentially dangerous animals in the first place? Mm. Well, that is because at the time, There were very little laws preventing that. You know, what laws were in place were, as said, very light. At the time of this tragic event in Ohio and a few other states, a home and land owner could buy as many tigers, lions, and other exotic animals as he or she wanted to. You know, as, as, as many as the heart desired. So even if you own just like an acre... Wow. Yeah, and and at the time they were technically under no obligation to even tell anyone that they owned these animals. Oh, that's nice. Now, to breed, exhibit or commercially transport animals across state lines, you did need a USDA license for that. Uh and this required that facilities be inspected periodically to check that they met some very basic standards. But other than that, there were no special checks or controls. Now, the change in these laws, amongst some of of the other details deemed suspicious by some, have surfaced conspiracy theories regarding the deaths of these magnificent animals and Terry Thompson. Right, and the agenda of the conspiracy theories, let's just get this out in the open. Yeah. What they're stating is that somebody killed him, that authorities killed him, that this was planned by Mm -hmm. authorities. And the reason why... Is because the laws are so loose mm-hmm. that they wanted to tighten up the laws. They wanted to make it harder on individuals to own these animals. And so anybody in Ohio or other states 
they start trying to point out these like little things that don't line up saying they made this happen. They made, they're the ones law enforcement are the ones that made this, uh, scare this panic. They're the ones that then, you know, massacred these animals Mm -hmm. and, and all for, for them to be able to pass, uh, tighter laws, stricter laws. Yeah. So the, the general thought is it's, it's the old argument. We've heard it a hundred times. It happens every time there's a school shooting or a mass shooting where people su- suggest, Hey, this was a scripted event that took place because we need stricter gun laws. Right. And so here we get these, these laws did pass. I think it's called the dangerous animal act or something like that. Right. But these laws did pass and they passed relatively quickly after this situation. So then people point to that and say, well, this was orchestrated so that these laws could go on the books. Now I don't want to get into the finer details of, of the law and these laws. Right. But one thing I would like to point out to people that make that argument is technically at one point we did have stricter animal laws, but they expired. Mm. And for whatever reason, the Ohio state government, once they expired, did not do a very good job of getting them back on the books. They well, just look, kind of sat there. Mm-hmm. And I've been thinking about this a lot this week, but I started thinking about this, like, you know, who do you blame here? And who do you, who do you point the finger? Who, who do you get angry with? Who do you, Lock eyes with. Bring them in close. Sniff them. Let them know. Use a piece of shit. Who do you do that here? And at, at some point I went, well, it's it's the people passing the laws too though, right? Aren't they responsible for this? But then I really started thinking as the week went on, you have a lot of other problems to deal with. Oh yeah. And you have millions of citizens. You have these you you have a lot of missing children, missing people. You have murders happening every day. You have all these things that you have to deal with. How many people in the state of Ohio actually own these types of animals? And out of those many people, how many own new, too many of them? Right. And how many of them, you know, cuz like look, if the, some guy in Cleveland owns 5 lions, and he has the the land for it, and he has the, you know, how many of them are causing problems? Mm-hmm. And so I I can't really put a blame on them when that has to be a low, it has to be low on their list of priorities. Mm-hmm. Well, the other thing that people like to point out too, Captain, is that many have suggested how would he have been able to open up all these cages? I mean, we're, it's not one or two cages; it was like fifty. Right. Yeah. So. Many people have suggested, hey, he would have been a- attacked and killed before he could get all those cages open. Uh-huh. Now, we should point out, if you look at pictures of his property, one, these cages were like in groups. You know, they would have like, I mean, picture like a, a grocery store where you have aisles. I am going to be posting a lot of this, uh, a lot of these pictures that we're talking about to our Instagram page. Go to Instagram at True Crime Garage. So picture this. This is the way this goes down. Yeah. I mean, you could you could open up a cage, walk three step and steps and open up another one. Right. Walk three steps, open up another one. I, I mean, very quickly he could open up all these cages. The the thing that I have a problem with with people saying that um I, I get their argument. I get the argument of saying, Hey man, you let go all these big, huge creatures and they didn't kill you before you got to the last cage. I get it. Right. But the thing here is we have a guy that, I mean, he, he did take care of these animals in some sense, you know, he, he did have some kind of relationship with these animals one. And then two, I mean, we we've all had, you know, dogs or cats or whatever. Have you ever just opened up a cage and not opened the door for the animal right. and, and notice that it, it takes the dog, uh, you know, three minutes or so to figure out that, Hey, I I'm free, you know? Yeah. Um, so I wonder if it's that situation. The other thing too, is we have people that had suggested, well, they didn't have to kill the animals. Well, well, let's stay on the, the cage for a sec- okay. second, because a lot of people also claim that there was chains and certain locks on these doors. So 
that would make it harder. The cages are close together, but there's chains and there's locks on all these doors. There is no evidence of that. Mm -hmm. And th you'll hear people talk about this. There was chains on all of them, so it would have took him so much longer. You have no evidence of that. That's just a speculation that you're making. Right, right. And the thing, too, that I think that gets lost along the way when people look for a conspiracy, mm -hmm. and, and it's fair that people look for a conspiracy, I think, because as you pointed out, when something like this happens, in any of the cases we cover, you want somebody to blame. You want somebody to hold account of, accountable for something eye. that you did not like or didn't agree with or that was just plain wrong. Well, right, and that's the thing. And and this is where I, uh, people that look into conspiracy theories get a bad rap. I mean, it's the idea like you take Sandy Hook. You're talking about one of the most horrible tragedies in the world, in the history of the world. But you can watch those videos where in the back of the school building, it's almost like they're going in a circle. Now, I don't know what that means, and I'm not saying that it's uh, that that Sandy Hook was a conspiracy. That's not what I'm saying at all. That happened, but what I can't make sense of is why are these individuals going in a circle in the back of the school? I don't understand that. And so that's not me calling the whole thing a hoax. That's me saying, well, what's up with that? Yeah. What's up with that? Don't what's start up that. With that? Um, but, but same way here, if he, if he is left-handed, okay. So he shoots a gun with his left hand. Well, it seems like the exit wound is coming from the left side of Thompson's head. Mm -hmm. So you got to put the gun in and then point it. That doesn't make a lot of sense. It would make more sense if you fired the gun with your right hand and you put that in your mouth, the exit wound would be coming out of the left side of your skull. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's likely, and this is this is tough okay. because we're doing a, a a radio show, but you know I'm going to show you something. I think it's likely that he did this that he uh, that he did one. It was a revolver, and from so the way that the putting autopsy, the gun in the mouth right side up, mm -hmm. he put it in his mouth upside down. That would be my guess because the way that the uh -huh. autopsy reads, it sounds like this is horribly graphic, but. The, the the top back portion of his head was blown off. And yeah, so this is a crime show, man. I I'm not doing this thing in two thousand nineteen I'm not doing the thing where I'm apologizing if it gets I didn't apologize. Okay, I just, just said saying, that it was <laughs> it's a true crime show. I There's didn't, gonna be some stuff. I didn't apologize. I just said that it was it's just, graphic. But the thing here is okay, who cares what hand he is? There's gun powder residue on him and it's not like they found it on his foot right you know I, I was i would also argue there's probably some kind of residue on his right hand and the thing that gets lost in the shuffle here when people take a look at this when they uh -huh. glance at this you do have to do some digging to find out that he kind of made a threat to his friend the night before when he said hey i've got i've got a plan and you'll know it when it happens yep i mean that's a threat and obviously, after all this happens, we know what his plan was. Yeah. And the thing that's, I mean, it's its tragic, but I just don't see a situation where this guy was murdered. We don't have any eyewitnesses that have anybody else on the property at the time of him releasing those animals. Right. That we know of. Right. right? Uh, interesting story, though. So I know a guy that was a sheriff here in uh, Zanesville. Mm-hmm. And he told me that one time that they had to go to the Thompson house and talk to him. And there was three sheriff on one side. I'm, I'm probably telling this story a little wrong. Please forgive me. But they're on this island. There was this island in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And on one side of the island was Thompson. On the other side of the island was the three sheriff. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, they could hear claws. And they know he has animals. Right. They know that they know that he has big cats. They know lions, maybe tigers. They don't know everything, but they know some stuff. Right. So coming down the hallway are these giant claws click. You know how your dog, you mm -hmm. can hear your dog. And they said, right behind Thompson just walks a tiger. I can't remember if it was just a regular tiger tiger or, or if it was the white tiger. Right. But they said it just walked right past him. He didn't flinch. He didn't even look at it. And it just walked into another room. And one of the guys, uh, you know, 
drew his gun on it because mm-hmm. he thought, oh, wow. Well, yeah, I'm going to gonna gonna need this if this thing decides to pounce on me. Could you imagine if you're sitting there talking to him and you start hearing those claw marks? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some things that are just hard to picture what you would do. Mm-hmm. And that's one of them. I mean, I want to know what to do. Well, and I'm going to say some unpopular things here, but I've, I I, normally do. I do want to put out my feelings or at least my thoughts. Let's not say feelings. We'll say thoughts on this whole event and how it went down. Look, I, I, I do not love the outcome of this situation. I don't love that. So many of these wonderful animals were killed. Um, but the, the thing here is we have, a police department that's responding to a situation and they had to make a call on the fly of what to do. What is in the public's best interest? How do we protect the other citizens in this area? And I think they had to make a judgment call on the fly. Again, I don't love the outcome of everything, but they had to protect the public there and they had to put these animals down as sad as it is. And the other thing, too, about this whole situation, man, for all these years, this mm. is going to be very unpopular. Okay. That, I, I apologize. Here's an apology. This will be our last show <laughs> of the, the year and the last show of our career. So for years, you know, this yeah. happened over seven years ago. I've really had a pretty strong hatred for Terry Thompson. And when we talk about when something terrible happens or something goes down, you want somebody to hold accountable. You want somebody to hate Look in the eye. for their actions. Look and, me in the eye. And so I've, for all these years, I've hated Terry Thompson. If you do want somebody to, to hold responsible for this, it's Terry Thompson. It's the guy that opened up the cages and killed himself. But the more that I got looking into this situation and the more I got studying Terry Thompson's life, I'm really just kind of left feeling, I, I'm not going to lie, I, I feel bad for the man. And yeah. and here's why, okay? I don't agree with getting 50 animals, whether they be exotic animals or just dogs and cats. Right. One person can't take care of that many animals. That, that's not something I agree with. But But you can try to love all those dogs. If you got 50 dogs, you could try. What I saw was a man that made a lot of bad decisions, but he had lots of collections. He collected guns. He collected cars. Right. He, this man served this country in Vietnam, and he saw some terrible stuff. He was, he was a gunner at the door of the uh, helicopters. Yeah. And so I don't want to go into the things that he probably went through during wartime, but it was very obvious to people that knew him that war changed him in a bad way. When he came home, there was often times where he would mention things like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to heaven. I've, I've killed too many people. I've, right. you know, during wartime, I've had to do some, some bad things. And what I see is more of a hoarder. It, you know, we see these situations on TV where the, you find some person that's like buried up uh, to their neck in trash in their home because they won't throw anything away. Yeah, I think we got this guy, Terry Thompson, who decided one day he wanted to start collecting animals. And I think probably his intentions were good in the beginning. I oh, think yeah, he, yeah. I think this is a psychological thing. It's, you know, like you said, with the hoarding or the collecting, it's almost like something happened in war and he, and he has some kind of broken uh, part inside him. And mm-hmm. He's trying to fix it by these collections, by whether it's gun collections or animal collections. Yeah. And he, I mean, this guy, he had a pilot's license at one time in his life. He had a very successful business where he, he was a Harley Davidson dealership that he owned yeah. for many years. So he made a lot of money and, but what he did with his money was he collected things, guns, cars, animals. And the thing was people pointed out and say, Hey, I'd go to Terry Thompson's property. I'd see all these beautiful cars from the fifties and the sixties, just sitting there neglected falling apart, rusting. Right. And what I think happened here was his last love might have been the collection of these animals. And I think at some point he just kept collecting them and collecting them and he couldn't take care of them. Right. And it, it, was it the right thing to do? No, hell no. Terribly wrong. He should have got out a long time ago. 
But what happened was when he got arrested on those gun charges and he went away to prison, everything that I could find, it seems like his, his, uh, life with his wife, his marriage was falling apart before he went to prison. But when he went to prison, she didn't visit him very often. They didn't have phone calls very often. She, she, he went to prison. She treated it almost as if their marriage didn't exist. And I think what happened is Terry Thompson got out of prison after being there for a year he came home and he felt like he had nothing. He, a man that had a lot and, and now he had nothing. No children, no, all of his things were neglected the entire time he was gone. And even his wife was not his anymore. Right. And I think when he had nothing, I think this guy was probably suicidal for some time. I think he was deeply depressed. And I think that he. Well, and pause, I'm just going to throw out another possibility there too. I mean, he could have some kind of early onset dementia or you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. where he's just not completely there in his head. I mean, it's very possible. I think the most horrible part of this entire story though, I think he let the animals out to punish his wife, right? I think he was going to kill himself anyway. And I think the, the letting the animals out was a way to punish his wife because they were, or at least spoke of them as if they were their children. And we've seen this in other cases that we've covered before in cases that we'll cover in the future. Sometimes the husband or wife will do something terrible to the children to punish their spouse. Well, right. But let's start with the idea that you're, you're the sum of all your actions, not the sum of one action, but meaning yes, he served this country and that's a good thing. He probably was a good friend to people, good businessman, fine, whatever. But this act, this is a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. This act is a piece of shit. These animals did not deserve to live that way. They did not deserve to die that way. Right. And um, and I would I would have hated to be one of the sheriffs and having these animals running free and the fear that you must have. I mean, we all see these majestic animals when you go to the zoo, but it's from a distance. Mm-hmm. But if this was in another yard, what would you feel? The fear that you'd have to f- fear. And a lot of these cops just, it was awful. And and like we said, there's there has been rumors that the, some of these cops have said mm. that, that this was fun, like hunting, right? Right. Is it possible that there was, out of all the uh, police officers involved, a lot of them, which Jack Hanna said, a lot of them were crying Mm -hmm. afterwards. A lot of them felt awful. A lot of them said, I have to go back and tell my son or my daughter, I killed a lion. Mm -hmm. I killed a tiger. Mm -hmm. Now, did one of those guys go to the bar, get drunk, and instead of telling the truth, decide that he's going to make some stupid joke about it possibly but i i really do think that this was a a very misfortunate situation and the cops did what they had to do everybody involved as far as jack hannon and them they had to just deal with those consequences mm-hmm. because those decisions when you first hear about it it almost sounds like the zoo is telling the law enforcement what to do but that's not what happened. They had to take it. They had to make actions happen before they can get the advice of law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as the conspiracy theory stuff goes, there are some people that own animals that claim that they reached out to law enforcement when they heard about this saying that they could help. Again, I don't fault the, I can't fault the sheriff because you, you're running out of time. Mm-hmm. You're running out of daylight. And I just don't see the conspiracy. I think there's enough evidence that the, uh, Thompson had a lot of demons from his past stuff going on mentally stuff going on in that present time with mm-hmm. his wife. Um, and just such a tragic thing. Yeah. And I think regarding law enforcement, we should keep in mind, they are the ones that called the zoo. They are the ones that called in the experts from the right. zoo. They, they didn't have to call anybody. Right. They tried to get them involved. The zoo did get involved, but they were the ones that put that action into place. And I think I'll leave it here for today with a statement from one of the officers on the scene that day. 
He said, I was sick shooting these animals because they didn't ask to be there. We all put off doing things we know we need to do. Security can be like that too. You know it's a good idea, but it always slips down the list of priorities. Well, fellow procrastinators, now is the time to act because Simply Safe's extended holiday sale ends soon. No contracts, no markups, no complicated installation. It's professional quality home security that's so easy you'll have it up and running in minutes. Just go to simplysafe.com slash garage and order before January 8th to save with their extended holiday sale. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. Real quick, Captain, before we wrap up here today, I want to mention that I got a very nice email from a woman named Gina who was suggesting that we cover the Jody Arias case. Well, we actually covered that way back in season two. Mm -hmm. So if you want to hear all of our old episodes for free, you can do that by getting the free Stitcher app. We have all of our previous seasons and years, whatever you want to call them, on there. Plus, you'll want to check out our premium show off the record on Stitcher Premium. I'm still receiving emails from people regarding our Jody Who's in True update that we did months back. So it's a hit show. Check it out. It's on Stitcher Premium. It's a hit. All right. I got some recommended viewing for you if you haven't heard. We have a famous person in the garage now. We know him as the Colonel. The rest of the world knows him now as Nick from True Crime Garage. <laughs> and uh, you are on the Lake Erie's Murders. Lake which, Erie Murders, yep. Lake Erie Murders, which uh, premiered last night on the ID channel. Yes. And so you want to check it out. It's three part, you're, you're part of the three-part series about, about the Amy Mihalovic case. Yes. So if you haven't checked that out, I don't know when it's playing. <laughs> I don't know when it's playing again. But you know, those those channels typically re-air things, and I'm sure you could see some of that at their website as well. Well, now that you're a celebrity, your pay does not increase here in the garage, my friend. And you know, maybe next time that you're uh, you're on TV, maybe you could ask me to join you. Well, I would have liked for you to be on, but they were afraid of your foul mouth. Oh. Well, until next week. All right, everybody, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Litter.